lift up and exalt and worship the name of Jesus. That's why we're here, and to study His Word together. If you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 15. Children, you're dismissed for Children's Church. Thanks for being in here with us. There's a couple offering boxes back as people uh, give their gifts and tithes. Thank you for your generosity. One is for the obstacle to remove uh, campaign to remove the debt. And so thank you for your uh, contributions and commitments to that. We'll get an update soon because I know people are still uh, filling out their cards and some are continuing to give to that. So thank you for that in advance. And then our general regular offering, general fund, is in the black box back there. Uh, I think we're a little bit behind so far for the year, but uh, we know that you are faithful and the Lord will help us to meet whatever need that we have before us. So thank you for that. Uh, a lot of prayer has gone out this week uh, for people. A lot of people have been hurting. So, yeah. Hey, Woody. How's your mom doing? Is she doing all right? She broke her shoulder. and uh, She's a tough woman, but Trudy's fallen, and that's why I've been lifting up her and praying for her, and as well as Shorty. So, And we're really in our congregation, uh, confidentially, because I don't want to list everybody's name, but we're getting hit by cancer in, in more ways than we ever have in the past. So just uh, if you haven't received the prayer request that Julie sends out each uh, week, uh, please uh, get on that prayer covering and just lift up your prayers uh, for the people in the body. There's a lot of needs. The Lynams are here today. Michael, uh, Kathy's husband, Amira's dad, uh, had all five of his toes removed this week in surgery. And so... Uh, uh, he's, his attitude is a testimony of just faithfulness and faith in God. So, But continue to pray for them and lift them up. And uh, yeah, there's just a lot of needs. Uh, Brenda Kramer mentioned to Julie and I that there was a pastor's wife who was leading a women's conference up in Mountain Lake, Minnesota, and, and passed away. And so the body of Christ uh, is just continues to need to be uh, mindful of all the needs of the body to lift each other up. And when we do that, we uh, unite our hearts. So, Father, hear our prayers as we pray for these people that I've mentioned and those who I haven't. A lot of needs within our body. We pray for your healing touch on the lives of those who are sick and those who have cancers. We ask that you would uh, help them to fight this battle, that your healing touch would be upon their bodies. We pray for uh, continued healing for, for Michael and as he has to learn uh, how to walk in a new way. And we ask for uh, patience and strength and your grace for Kathy and Amira. We thank you, God, for uh, the many gifts of people here, how they come alongside and visit people in the hospital or come to their home with a meal. We continue to lift up Phil to heart, and we just pray for his journey of recovery. God, there's so many. We lift up Trudy. We ask for your strength for her healing. And we pray, God, that you would just... Uh, move in our midst in a way that you'd help us to, to be your hands and feet, to be your, your words of encouragement to people. And now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, the study of your word be pleasing and acceptable to you. You're our rock, you're our redeemer, and we praise you and give you honor today. Amen. A lot more of people that I could be praying for today as well. Today, as we look at this passage in Romans 15, last week we looked at God giving the gift of encouragement through the Scripture and through a spirit of unity, and He really emphasized all that one another, all the one another passages, and that we do that as Christ, strengthening each other as Christ has accepted us, we accept one another as Christ has loved us, we love one another, we honor one another, we rejoice with one another. And, uh, and then in verse 14, after he goes about how this building up the church, he's going to challenge us to, to mature, to grow up in the faith, to, to, to continue uh, in a way that uh, we don't just stay at one level. And so maturing in, in ministry, maturing in our faith, in, in what he calls his service to God. So verse 17, he says, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. That's what I want to talk with you about today, that each of you have a service to God as well. And that you would glory in Christ, that Christ has called you to that service. And not only that, but he's called you to that, he's equipped you for that so that you can bring glory to God. And so it's a, it's a powerful uh, opportunity for us as a church to take this theology that Paul wrote in Romans 
and put it into practice. That's what he's doing. He's starting out by encouraging. He told us, encourage one another with the scripture and encourage one another, build them up. And now he's going to do that to this church in Rome. And so he continues to to live this out, this theology. Paul wasn't in some, seminaries are great, but he wasn't in some uh, high lofty ivory tower in a seminary writing this book. He was on the mission field. It was in practice that this was being lived out that he wrote this in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says in verse 14, this first, I want to talk to you about three ambitions that if we, or aims, they kind of going back and forth, aims that we have something to shoot at, something, a, a target to shoot at. Make these our aims. They were Paul's. But he also uses the word ambition. This was his ambition. And so going deeper than just having the target on the wall that we're aiming at, but that we'd really have this ambition built in our hearts. Because if if this this is how we can expand our reach as a church, this is how we can increase our service to God as individuals by focusing on these aims. And the first one is competency to instruct. And he says, I myself, verse 14, I am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. I have written you quite boldly on some points as to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave to me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with this priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And so this is amazing because Paul moves from the sense of this is what a, you could do that to any church that you didn't know. Here's the marks of a healthy church, one anothering, accepting all the one another's. But he moves from that and he starts to encourage them and he's saying, hey, I'm convinced of this, that, that you're complete, not, not that you're perfect, but you're, you're prepared. And, and it's amazing because he did, he's never been there yet. He's only heard about them. As a, as a church, he's only instructed them as a church, he, and yet he knows, he says, I'm, I'm fully convinced in this, that you're, you have this goodness, this one another, and it's talking about the character, not perfect, not perfectly good, no one is good except Christ, and yet they have, because of what Christ is doing in us individually, we have this goodness because we're doing it in Jesus' name. And it's the goodness of, as Christ, as Christ, and he says, you have this, this character of Christ in you. That's the goodness you have. He says, I'm, I'm convinced of it. And I'm going to tell you, I'm convinced of that in, the, in this body here. I'm convinced that you have this goodness, this character of Christ, that you have an ambition to show Christ's love to other people. I've seen it. And I want to just fan that flame a little bit and say, keep going. Keep ministering to one another. Keep fellowshipping with one another. Come to the women's brunch and be encouraged by one another. Come to the, the service day and serve with one another. It's, it's a great opportunity for us to build up one another. And he says, I'm convinced that you're full of this, and you're full of this knowledge of the Scripture in enough way that you are competent to instruct one another. It's amazing for him to be able to see that without having been in that church. And so he says, encourage one another, but then he does it. He lives it out, encouraging their character, encouraging their, the, the goodness that they have as, as one another's. And can, can, they're contributing uh, their gifts, uh, the, the gifts that they had from the Holy Spirit. A whole chapter in chapter 12. You have this gift, you have this ch- gift, keep going. Keep going with that. And so he says, I'm, I'm competent in you, I'm convinced of your competency because I've seen it in your character, I've heard of it, and because he's confident in what the Holy Spirit is doing in their midst, that the Holy Spirit is giving them gifts for their growth. He's competent of the, the knowledge that they're basing their ministry on the scriptures, and they're building up the body to fulfill the Great Commission, and that they're going to bring glory to God by everything they do. It's a powerful encouragement for him to say that to them, to write that to them. This is what a healthy body looks like. A healthy bar, church body is, is people who are concerned about doing what is good for another person. Doing what is good and acceptable in the eyes of God. This is what a healthy church is, a mark of it is growing. Growing in our maturity, growing in our faith, growing in our knowledge of the word. These are marks of a healthy church. And he sees that. And he says, keep doing that. In fact, I am so confident, he says, in you that I'm, I'm confident that you are competent to instruct somebody else, 
that you can come alongside somebody else. He's talking about the marks of he's, he was mentored into faith by Christ himself but by others. And, by, and he had teachers to teach him the Old Testament. And he was mentored. And now he's walking alongside with other people. He doesn't ever go on a missionary journey by himself. I, I love the Alaska trip and they're going. But I don't, I don't want Pastor Rob to go by himself. So somebody go with him. And we always are in ministry. We're, we're ministering. We're being mentored by somebody. Somebody has definitely ministered into my life over the years, many people. And then we walk in ministry with somebody, and then we mentor somebody else. So who are you mentoring? You're competent to do it. I want to tell you that today. I want you to hear it straight from me, but I hope the Holy Spirit will just affirm it in you. You are competent to instruct somebody. You are competent to be involved in ministry. You are competent to pick up something here and be involved in it here at this church or in the community locally or globally even. I mean, think about it. We've got Alaska. we got Tanzania over here. we got uh, uh, Puerto Rico. We haven't heard yet from Emmanuel and, and Tegan. We want to hear from them about going to Puerto Rico. we got people going all over the place. And we've got people like Campus Faith Clubs right here locally, and we have other ministries here locally. And so where are you mentoring? Where are you picking this up? Who are you investing in? Because you're competent to do it. You're, you're competent to go in Christ on a mission trip and to serve Him. You're ready. That's what He's saying. You're not perfect, but you're prepared. And some of you, I think, are sitting here and going like, yeah, I'm not really ready. I'm not prepared. Yes, you are. Listen, listen to the word, listen to the Holy Spirit and, and pick something up, pick up a ministry that he has is, he is planted in your heart. And that's what he did and that's what he's boldly proclaiming to them. Keep going. He uses a word uh, for servant, for minister that he hasn't used in this, uh, I don't think in the book at all, but first, certainly not in this chapter. We saw it in verse 8 last week. I tell you that Christ has become a servant to the Jews. He said, just as Christ served, we should serve. And Christ was a servant to the Jews, and he called me, Paul says, to be a servant to the Gentiles. And he uses the Greek word diokoneos, which is where we get our word deacon. It's a serving word. Get up and serve somebody. Care for somebody. And you have done that well. You're competent in it. You really are. You, you bring meals to people. You visit people. You pray for people. Some of you write cards to people. That What's that? A card? And put it with a stamp? What is that? You actually lick the envelope? We don't know what that means. But and you do it. And so some of you do it in all kinds of unique ways. You're deacons, you're deaconesses, you're serving. It's beautiful. And then he's used a harder word earlier in. He uses the word for, for servant, doulas. And that word is slave, actually. But it means bond servant. It means I'm connected. He says, I'm, a, I'm doulas. I'm a bond servant with Jesus Christ. I'm so connected to Christ. He's my master. I'm going to do what he calls me to do. And so if God is calling you to do something as a servant, do us, uh, be, be that servant in his name. But this word is different. And i got to brush up on my Greek. The one he uses in 16 is uh, liturgon, liturgon, or liturgos, different forms of it. And, and then he explains it in uh, following it. I'm a minister. I'm a, I'm a liturgon. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm doing a, a priestly duty. It's where we get our English word liturgy. I'm, I'm doing a, we don't know much about liturgy in our church here because we, we're just too loose and people get offended by that sometimes. But in, in liturgical churches, you, you have an opening prayer and you have an opening song and you have a, a, a reading from the Old Testament and the New Testament and you have this. And sometimes the pastor just actually just preaches in a certain amount of time. And uh, it's kind of an interesting concept. And then, and then you have a benediction and things like that. And so it's very, it's very orderly and it's very good. It's very, it's very powerful. Um, it's an offering. It's a priestly duty, he says, to, to present. And what's his priestly duty? And so he's, he's pulling back on his, his knowledge of the Old Testament, what the priests would do in the Old Testament. We sing a song about, called Worthy of It All, and it has a, a line in there, day and night, night and day, let incense arise. And some people are like, ooh, I don't, I don't know, I like that. That whole incense, it sounds a little mystical and mythical and things like that. No, it's, it's the prayers it's the prayers being offered. It's a, it's a liturgy. It's, a, it's, it's writing the prayers and, and singing and offering it to God. Let it rise to, to him. And so that's what liturgy is. And, he, and Paul is saying, I have this priestly duty that I'm going to bring the gospel to Gentiles because that's what God called me to do. And I'm offering these lives 
as a sacrifice to you, God. Every time you bring a, a pie or a meal, or so, I like pie, but I just I bring a meal. If I go to the hospital, bring pie. But uh, bring something to someone. It's an offering that you're bringing. It's a sacrifice to say, I want to do it for you, God. I'm doing it for you, and I'm doing this, whatever it may be. And each of you have it. You have the ability to do that, and they're actually doing it. To wipe up the mouse poop underneath the sink is a priestly duty, Cindy. Oh, I hate mice. And so we got to trap them, we got to get them, we got to put them in their proper place. But it's a priestly duty to clean up and to, to care for the children. Now, somebody in the nursery forgot their priestly duty, and I was picking up a little bit this week, and, and there was a diaper in the nursery. Come on now. That's a priestly duty. Thank you for serving in the nursery, but take it all the way up. <laughs> let it ride. Let it go out. Get it to the trash, please. Because it's like, oh, I don't want to do this. But you're doing it. All the kinds of things that you're doing, you're doing it as an offering, as a sacrifice. And when you put it in that context, when you say, God, I want to do this for you. I want to take this person to lunch. I want to uh, be the friend. I want to drive this person here. I want to do this. It's my offering to you, God. And Paul took it as a priestly duty. My mom, growing up Catholic, wanted me to be a priest. She told Julie that when I told her we were getting married. I really wanted him to be a priest. And she's like, hey, thanks. Welcome to the family. But uh, what she doesn't realize, but maybe now in heaven she realized I am a priest and so are you. And so Peter writes about that. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. Because every time we offer something in a way to God for his purposes and for his glory, something that he's calling us to sacrifice and do as an offering, whether it be in the nursery or with the children right now or with the youth or cleaning up around the property. This is God's house, so let's clean it. Let's honor him. This is God's property he's gifted us with. Let's, let's make it presentable as an offering to God, not so that we can pat ourselves on the back and clean the highway and say, oh, look at us. We adopt the highway. No, for God's glory, for God's honor. He says to the church that he's writing to in 1 uh, yeah, Peter, as you come to him, Jesus, the living stone who was rejected by men but chosen by God who's precious to him, you also are like living stones. You're part of this building. You are being built into a spiritual house and you are a holy priesthood and you offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. Oh, don't you want to be a part of that? Don't you want to be a part of that building, that that body that together we offer acceptable sacrifices to God. He looks at verse 9. He's, these are hard. We have to, I have to say them loud to you. I have to get excited because you don't believe it, a lot of you. You're a chosen people. You're royal. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. A people belonging to God. And he's not talking about just Israel here. He's talking here. He's writing to the church. Jew, Gentile, you have now become this people of God. Why? So that you can declare his praises. Well, for what? For calling you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are so different in this body right here. But you know what we have in common? We were all in darkness at one time. We were called out of that. And we're now in the light together. We all needed to receive mercy. We were alike in that way. And now we have received it. We're alike in that way. We're different in a lot of ways. I want to tell you, you're different. We all have a priestly duty. So what will you do? How will you make it your aim? What will you do to make it your aim to, to recognize that you are competent to instruct another person in the word of God? That you are competent to mentor somebody else. You are competent to engage in a ministry, a service to God. I don't know what that is. I'm praying that God will put that on your heart. But you're ready. So step into it. Do it, okay? And if it's hard... Like the ministry that Beth is doing, the Save One Ministries, it's hard. You're going you're gonna to have pushback. And some people will shut doors in their face and have. But if God's called you to do it, you do it. And you don't worry about a door hitting your nose. Because you, you, have, you have trust that God's called you to do it. Paul ran into all kinds of barriers. But God called him. 
So make it your aim now to be a minister of the gospel. What will you do to increase that competition, that, that, not competition, that, that competency? To say, I want to I grow in character, in the goodness of God. I want to grow in giftedness. Where have you gifted me to do, serve you in ministry, God? I'm praying that, that this will be true today, that the Holy Spirit will just do something new and fresh in you, that there will be something burning in you that you will say, i, I got to do that. God's called me to do it. I've said no to it before, and, and I won't say no to it anymore. I'm saying yes to it now because God's called me to do it. Maybe here in the church, maybe here locally, maybe globally. And so the second ambition is then, as we've been called to do that, to do some type of ministry, make sure we're doing it with a Christ-centered purpose. It's not about us. It's about a Christ-centered mission. Listen to what he says. I came to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles so that the Gentiles come to this offering. And then verse 17, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. He's, he's the reason. I'm going to give him all the glory. I'm going to give him all the honor. I'm not going to, he says that rates in verse 18, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God. By what I have said and what I have done, in word and in deed, by the words that I proclaimed to the Gentiles, some of them came to know Jesus. By the deeds that I did among them, some of them came to know Jesus. We don't know what God's going to use. Is he going to use your words or your deeds? We don't know. That's up to him. But we take Christ's name, like we sang about, we take Christ's name and we bring it, we carry it to people, wherever we're at. It's such a beautiful picture of God's calling and, 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 and the diversity and the unity of the body together. When one of us obeys God's calling, we see this, uh, this diversity because you've been called to something and you've been called and you've been called and we're all called to something different. That's how the church started. Jesus called 12 disciples. They didn't like each other. They weren't the same. Fishermen don't like tax collectors. They don't hang out. And yet God, Jesus built them as his group, and he built them in the diversity of that group and gave them unity of purpose. Follow me. Serve like I've served. Love like I've loved. Bring the message like I brought the message. As God sent me, I send you. Takes that diverse group and makes them one in purpose, a Christ-centered mission. That's powerful. And we're all different. And then, so then, then Pentecost comes and all these other people say, I want to hear more about this Jesus. And then it grows further. And so then you got Peter and John bringing the name of Jesus and the power and the healing of Jesus to a blind man and to a lame man right there by the temple in Jerusalem. And they see God moving through the, the disciples there in Jerusalem. And then they say to Philip, hey, Philip, you're going to go and we're going to send you to where? You know? Where do they send Philip? Samaria, Samaritans, mutts, mixed breeds, people like me that don't have an ethnicity to hold on to, dirty, not a part of our group, not pure, not, not the group that, that God called and chose his whole chosen people, and yet we're bringing the message to them, Philip, go and give it to Samaria because they need to receive mercy just like we received mercy. Brings the message to Samaria. Wow. Jerusalem to Samaria. And then Saul, he's like this dirty-minded murderer just going after Christians and killing them. And Jesus meets him on the road and calls him to himself and renews him and makes him a new creation. That's what God did to me. Did he do that to you? And then he changes his name and he calls him Paul. And he says, now, you know, Paul, you're going to the Gentiles. Jerusalem, Samaria, Gentiles, the nations, the nations. Let's go. Where are you going? And Paul writes this. He says, God is, I'm his chosen instrument to carry the name of Jesus to the Gentiles. I'm his chosen instrument. And I want to tell you today, and I want you to hear it, and I want you to receive it. You are his chosen instrument. You are God's chosen instrument to go, to carry the name of Jesus Christ where you go this week. Carry his name, carry his name proud, carry his name in a way with, with goodness, with character, with purpose, with a, to exalt Christ. Carry his name, you're his chosen instruments. It's not just pastors and missionaries and teachers who are his chosen instruments. It's his people who are chosen instruments, and you're part of the people. You're part of the body. 
carry the name of Jesus. All these different callings, all these distinct gifts within this body here, a diverse missions, all united in a Christ-centered mission of bringing his name and the message of salvation to make disciples. By words, sometimes. By deeds, yep, sometimes. By just being present, sometimes. Wow. You carry the name of Jesus. And so in Christ's exalted worship, in Christ's proclaimed acts of service, works, in Christ's Centered mission, near and far, going to the world. So he says, I, I started out, where did he go? Uh, verse 19, by the power of the signs and miracles through the power of spirit. So from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, Illyricum, Ill, you break it in, Ill like you're sick, lyrics like the songs, and, and then, and then come, come unto me, Illyricum. It was so terrible at Greek in seminary. It took me so long to get through it. Illyricum, what does that mean? Yugoslavia, Albania, okay, 1,400 miles from here where he was sent to there. And he says, now I want to go to come to you. I want to go to Rome and come to you. And I want to go to Spain because I want to go and bring the message of Jesus Christ where it hasn't gone yet. I want to go where God's called me to go, first of all, and now I'm going to go to, to people who haven't heard yet. You're God's chosen instrument to do the same. The lead, the Holy Spirit leads you. 1,400 miles. It's my ambition, he says, he writes this, to, it's my ambition to preach the gospel of Christ. So next Sunday, we're going to look at his expanding journey where he's bringing the gospel to others. And we're going to hear from uh, Michelle and, and Julia next about Guatemala, right? And how God brought them to Guatemala. What did God do in Guatemala? And like I said, hopefully we'll hear about Puerto Rico. And then we'll be hearing sometime this summer about uh, Alaska. And then summer this summer, some people are coming from uh, the Teen Challenge. And we're going to hear about how God works in Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. You see, they're all diverse. It's all diverse uh, situations. It's all diverse people. It's all diverse missions. But it's all one. Exalting Christ. And so you heard from campus uh, faith clubs today. Their mission is empowering students to share the hope and love of Jesus in the schools. Did you know that Jesus and prayer and the Bible is still in the schools? It's in there because leaders are equipping students who are in the schools. That's their, their they are God's chosen instrument. You're not, you're not supposed to go to the school. Don't go to the school. Unless you're a lunch lady or a teacher or a track coach or something like that. But I don't go to the schools. But these campus faith club leaders, they equip the students to bring Jesus, to carry the name of Jesus in the schools, and they're praying and they're reading the Bible. Don't, there's no law that's going to keep Jesus out of the schools. And so they're a powerful ministry. Top at their table and talk to them. Doug's here. I don't know, is Mark saying Doug or did he leave? Huh? Whatever. He gave you the handout, gave it to you, so you'll be there. And so you can uh, empower and equip your students. And then Young Life. Some people ask, well, Young Life, that's the same thing as Campus Face Clubs. No, it's not. Young Life has a different mission. Why do we support both of them, people ask me. Because the mission of Young Life is to introduce adolescents to Jesus Christ and help them grow in their faith. They're at that entry point. They're entering. They're engaging in relationships. And, and then they hang, can hand them off to campus faith clubs or hand them off to the church or whatever. And then we can equip. And then, and then they, you, you see we're caring about youth all along the journey. If you want to know about Young Life, you ask me because I'm a I'm in, I'm in person in faith in, in, the, in ministry because somebody entered my life with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ask Jurgen, are you still chair? Oh, chair of the committee. I'm going to talk about handing out the baton pretty soon. You better, you better get ready to hand that off to somebody. How long are you going to do that? And so, young life, how long am I going to do this? You know, we, we have all these ministries. You can go to the wall and you can see them. You can see all these things here. But some of the people on this sheet, they're old. <laughs> they're like me. And we're wondering, who's going to be next? Who can we add globally, locally to do these things? Who's going to reach it? Young Life has all these other cool ministries as well as their clubs and stuff. Did you know they have a, a ministry called uh, Capernaum? What happened in Capernaum? Well, remember there was a roof and there was a, a paralytic man and he needed and he, they brought him to Jesus. And so the Capernaum, Young Life Capernaum leaders develop relationship with teenagers with disabilities where all are invited and celebrated and needed and so they, they continue there. That's a different ministry. Do you see my point? 
It's a beautiful mosaic because there's so many different people, so many different missions, so many different ministries all focused on one goal, exalting Jesus Christ, inviting people to Christ, getting the word. We're going to hear from Phil Nelson in a couple weeks about Gideons. They're different too. We're glad they are. They distribute and they personally witness the word of God, evangelism, engaging, equipping, beautiful ease. But that's not what's exciting about it. What's exciting about it is that they're all lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul says. I'm boasting not, I'm not boasting in the work I did here or did there. I'm not boast about anything except what Christ accomplished. And he writes about it in 2 Corinthians 10, but I don't have enough time to get there today. So you read that one. But this humble church says, I'm not going to boast in who we are as a church or what work we're doing or whatever. I'm going to boast in what God is doing. I'm going to boast in what God is doing in this ministry. And so we see this, and we see some things. You gotta, that's why we need this competency to instruct, because somebody has a Christ-centered mission that God placed on their heart, but they can't always do it forever. And so they need to step away sometimes. When they need, and so hand it off. We have 26 areas of leadership at Living Waters Church, 26 distinct ministries. Each one of them needs a leader. Right now we have six spots that are wide open. They're open. And each one of those leaders, like I said, needs to have somebody alongside them. So if you, let's bring it down to 25. Let's kick one of those leaders out. Because I need to do easy math. And so we have 25 leadership positions, and you have to have somebody alongside you that's doing it as well. So we have 50 people. We got 50 people. We have 50 people here. Why, why do we have openings? Sometimes it gets dropped. I got these from Kylie, track athlete who coaches. And I said, okay, I need some batons because we need to get this idea across that we got we to gotta work together as a team. We have to be competent to instruct somebody to hand it off, a Christ-centered mission. She said, okay, but don't drop them. I said, but I have to drop one because otherwise the illustration doesn't work. She says, okay, drop the gold one because the, the boys use that one, and they're always <coughs> dropping it. But don't drop the black one. And some ministries have, have been dropped. That's not some people's fault. They just had to, they had to step away. They had other things to do. They had life seasons in life, different things that were going on that God's calling them to maybe something else. Or God's, it just got, or they passed away like Roxy McGraw. And so care ministries got dropped. And care ministries has gone, where is it? We got all these people who have needs. And who, who's going to pick it up? Don't pick it up because I stand up here and cry about it. Pick it up because God's called you to it. Pick it up because God's, God's put a burden on your heart that there's another way to do caring ministries. Roxy did it great, but there's another way to do it. And maybe God's calling you to pick it up. And those of you that are doing a Christ-centered ministry, don't do it alone. You're going to watch the Olympics. Anybody going to watch the Olympics this summer? Five of you. So this illustration doesn't fit anymore. But I want to watch track. But the thing that amazes me about track is you're going to have some of the fastest, best athletes running track, and they haven't even been selected yet in our country for the Olympics. They're still going through the trials. How are they, once they get, once they get chosen, how are they then going to work with a team to work on the relays? They're not going to have time. And that's what's happened in the church that we just prepare for myself, prepare for my event, prepare for my thing, and we're not preparing for the relay. And so you're going to see some of the best athletes drop the baton. You're going to see some terrible handoffs because they hadn't worked together. They worked on their thing, but they didn't work on handing it off. And so you've got an old guy like me who stammers. I stuttered a bunch of times today. I'd stumble if I stepped down there, so I'm not going to do that. And they're wondering... When are you, don't, don't let me drop it. Don't let me just quit and walk away. Encourage me to hand it off to somebody. Encourage me. I, this, isn't, this isn't my ministry to stand up here and preach. Sometimes I hand it off to Gene Dame. Sometimes I hand it off to Russ Bacon. Sometimes I hand it off to other people, guest speakers. This is God's ministry. Rob preaches, and you're all like, oh, you all love when Rob preaches. I know, I hear it. Oh, you got to have Rob preach more. I get it. It's fine. But it's about this, the word of God. And Rob's going to preach in May and this summer, and then Zach Hill is going to preach this summer. Uh-oh, oh, oh, is right. Yeah. And so, but we hand it off. 
and, and we catch something, and don't, don't drop it. Give, give them the stick. Mentor somebody. God's put a ministry on your heart. Now who are you going to call alongside? Who are you going to build your team? So that the kingdom grows. So that the kingdom keeps growing. Gently. You have a ministry. A Christ-centered ministry. Your chosen instruments. Now by the power of the Holy Spirit, do it. Do what God's called you to do. That's a holy ambition. And that's what I end with here. Did you see that? By the power of the signs and miracles through the power of the Spirit so that this gospel message would go. To preach the gospel. Not what somebody else is doing. Not building on somebody else's foundation. And he quotes Isaiah 52. So as it's written, so those who are not told about him will see. Those who have not heard will understand. Those those who didn't see him, those who the gospel didn't go to, people love to debate that. You know, well, what about the people that never hear? Well, then go. If you're so concerned about the people didn't hear, then go to them. Well, what about the people that never saw the miracles? Then to help them to see Jesus. Answer the call. But know this. It's not by our strength. It's by God's plan. It's by God's purposes. It's by God's strength. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, I know Isaiah. I know Isaiah 52. I know about the, the suffering servant, the Messiah who's going to come. And then he writes in Isaiah 52, we saw it earlier in Romans in our study, he said, beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of Jesus Christ to other people. Oh, well, you got beautiful feet when you bring Jesus' name to other people. When you exalt Christ and you bring them. Now he says it even further. He says, in quoting this, they are going to be people who have never seen Jesus, never heard, never understood, and they're going to understand, and they're going to open their eyes, and they're going to see Jesus. Why? Because the Spirit is at work in you and through you, and the Spirit can make it happen. Sometimes the Spirit hinders us, he says in verse 22, I, I was hindered from coming to you, but often he helps us. He equips us, he encourages us, he comes alongside us, and he gives us the power. In the New Testament, in the Old Testament church, we sang that song about uh, the kind of glory. What was that? That was when God was present in the cloud and in the fire over the, the people. The, the, and so it's a, Hebrew, it's a Hebrew way of remembering God was there with us in the cloud to protect us from the heat and this day and in the fire to guide us during the night and to keep us warm. God was present with us. Oh, let your glory fall on us. Let your glory lead us. Let your glory come. And then in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes and just gets poured out and all these things are happening. That are, that are, the Spirit is doing new things and 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 Peter says, look at uh, what, what we John and I just did here in Jerusalem. It's not us. It's in the name of Jesus. That's how this happened. It's because of Jesus, whom you crucified, by the way. And he kind of brings the gospel in there. And he says, it's by Jesus' name. And then what happens when the church gets together and Paul, Saul becomes part of the church? Ooh, we didn't like him. But now he's part of us. And we're praying together and we're worshiping with all these diverse, different people that we don't always get along with. And what happens when we come together in unity, when we lift up and exalt the name of Jesus together, when we study his word together, when we worship him together? What happens when we pray in Jesus' name? The Holy Spirit shows up. And the Holy Spirit showed up and he said, set apart for me, Paul and Barnabas, set apart for me this ministry. Set apart for me, set apart for me. Do it again. Do it again, God. Move in our hearts in a way by your power, and you will give you all the glory and all the credit and all the honor. If it's by our strength that we proclaim, if we're proclaiming Jesus for our, don't do it. It's, nothing, it's not about us. If it isn't in Jesus' name, then don't proclaim it. If it isn't for God's glory, then don't do it. Don't promote it. But if it is, they will understand and see the salvation of our God. Set apart by the power of the Spirit. The worship team is coming up. Rachel found a song called Echo. Echo, echo, echo. Uncreative people like me, if you ever go to those places and you see an echo or you hear a place, you know there's a place that can echo, you pick a word. And you think, well, I'll just do echo. Echo, echo, echo. It repeats. That's what an echo is, right? More creative people... 
they do sentences or longer words and see how it can echo. We're called the echo. We're called the echo Jesus. Echo his name. What he taught, we teach. How he lived, we echo it and live that way. What he speaks, what he spoke, we speak. And so if he says, hey, the paralytic man is forgiven, then you now have the authority in Jesus' name to say, in Jesus' name to say, you are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ. You have that authority to say, there is one who forgives sins. His name is Jesus. Redeemed in Jesus' name. Get up and walk. Walk. It's Jesus in word. You are saved. You are rescued. Echo those words because those are the words of Jesus. Those are the words that he echoed. He, he stated from the Father and we echo him. So, Father, help us to be the people who are fully competent in the knowledge of the Scripture to instruct another. To bring a Christ-centered, Christ-exalting ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we will give him all the credit and give you all the glory.